lot of you know me as a strawberry breeder and geneticist and have heard me talk about strawberries, so you might be surprised that I also work with raspberries. I also did a little work with blackberries. They're all in the same subfamily, and I'm actually a geneticist, so there's some genetics in common, and that's why I was taking a look at some raspberries. And there's some other reasons, but they're really not important, so that's fine. So to, um, what I was, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to say that um, the research uh, primarily was completed by Julia Harshman, pictured here. She's the one on the left. She wanted me to make sure to tell you that. <laughs> so uh, she's with the University of Maryland. Her major professor was Chris Walsh. How many know him? Probably a lot, yeah, very nice fellow. And she's completed her master's degree. That's the research I'm going to tell you about. And right now she is at Washington State University um, pursuing a PhD in apple breeding. She's working on physiological traits. And so let's not forget her because she'd like very much to come back to this part of the country and continue to serve growers here. So uh, this was a collaborative effort. You know, graduate students have, have committees and uh, Julia, obviously, in the front there. Wayne Jurek is still here? Where are you? He was here. Anyway, maybe you saw him. He's a pathologist, works with the USDA in Beltsville with me. And this has to do with post-harvest quality and post-harvest decay. So he was very important in this research. Um, and then there's me. And I had a raspberry field. And it was for other purposes. I was looking at virus tolerance and trying to look in, in black raspberries. And uh, I, because red raspberries are sort of notorious for transmitting virus, or at least that's what I was told, I had this grid of black and red raspberries. And I substituted in a few yellows and a few purples because we had a scientist in our group who was looking at antioxidant capacity and that sort of thing. So we were using this field for several fun, uh, purposes. And Julia selected several different genotypes listed here to conduct her research on, and she did it primarily uh, based on pro productivity. Uh, the, the field had been in existence for about two years before she uh, came along and took an interest in it and wanted to conduct research on it. And so most of the cultivars listed here are you know, old standards, things you may recognize. You'll also notice that there's not an equal portion of the different color groups. Part of that's because, well, there just aren't as many yellow and purple cultivars out there. And also there's the fact that I was mostly interested in the black raspberries. But there were enough here that she could try to look at various post-harvest quality traits on a group basis, on a color group basis. And she's also uh, doing analyses that look at differences among genotypes within color group, but this, uh, this part of her research just looks at the color group, and it by itself is very interesting. So I'm hoping you can read some of these, and if you see some you, you uh, can relate to. Also, there are a few breeding lines in there. At the bottom is one from Harry Schwartz's breeding program. Uh, sort of in the middle are um, well, is one from the New York program and another one from Harry's program. So you may recognize them mostly. So this is a picture of the raspberry field. I am not the greatest raspberry grower in the world, which is why, uh, <laughs> yeah, I really could use your help, Molly. <laughs> You're in your dad's. Um, it's, uh, uh, but it, it, that's another reason why we used only the, 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 uh, better producing cultivars is because if you're not very good at growing them, you can only get enough fruit from the ones that uh, are going to give you fruit no matter how badly you treat them. We also have at Beltsville a, um, a, a, real, a real gift in that our research support services has a person who collects weather for us and for NOAA, you know, um, where all your weather information comes from. And we have weather equipment weather detecting equipment out there, weather recording equipment that measures uh, the temperature, humidity, the solar radiation, precipitation, and, 
and we have data available to us on a daily basis. And the reason I mention this is because we looked at the effect of different types of weather three days and the day before harvest and how it affected post-harvest quality. So that's why, anyway, I mentioned that. Now this is Julia. She's harvesting fruit uh, for the post-harvest ratings. And she harvests them into little they're called co-star plates, but they're little plates with wells just the right size for a small raspberry. And then the bottom of each well was lined with a little piece of filter paper so that we could see very clearly if the berry was, she calls it, bleeding. So it's leaking juice. And then, um, so this is harvested every two weeks, and then it's put into storage. There's cold storage and warm storage, and neither one of them is terribly, I mean, the warm storage is warmer than then room temperature, the cold storage, is not exactly what a uh, commercial grower would be using to store, but, but there's warmer and colder temperatures. And then she, um, every other day, she counted the number of decayed berries and the number of berries that were showing bleed on that filter paper. <coughs> she also took other berries from the plots after she harvested for, for that previous test, and she measured firmness uh, quantitatively with this meter that she's working there, uh, working with there, and she did that on the first day after we harvested, and then six days later after they were store stored in cold storage. And then with other berries, because when she squished them they're not exactly very pretty, uh, she measured the color quantitatively, light, dark, blue, yellow, green, red, the day of harvest and the day, or six days after cold storage. And then I mentioned Dr. Shu and Wang, who used to be with our lab. She's retired. Um, a lot of her work is why we know that berries have antioxidants. So she made her mark in the world, and now she's retired and enjoying grandchildren. Uh, all the fruit that, that uh, were left over after we harvested for those other tests, we bagged, we, um, we pulled the air out of it, we put nitrogen in there so that no more <laughs> oxidation would go on in storage and then they were frozen and then after they were frozen and all the samples were put together then she measured the antioxidants and the the flavor components that are really important you know the sweet acid balance soluble solids titratable acids pH that sort of thing and then the phenolics and anthocyanins were measured too you'd expect for instance that black raspberries would have more anthocyanins than yellow raspberries makes sense right but what about phenolics some of those are, I mean, some of those are anthocyanins, but some are colorless. So all those were measured, plus antioxidant capacity in two different ways. And then Julia wanted to look at the question of, um, you know, if you pick raspberries, is there any way possible that any of these color groups could be picked before they were fully riped, ripened, and then, you know, they would ripen afterwards like tomatoes do, right? Well. Uh, she measured ethylene production and respiration, which is the amount of CO2 that's given off. Well, the first of the results are that none of the berry color groups were significantly softer after cold storage. They were softer, but it wasn't statistically significant, so it was barely noticeable. That's the first thing we found out. Then there's color. Well, we found that the black and the purple raspberries got darker in cold storage, but the red and the yellow did not. The reds really didn't change at all. The yellows became a little more red and less yellow, i.e. orange. But I have to qualify this because <laughs> the only yellow that we took these data on was kiwi gold, and you know what it does. I mean, Anne was the other one that we looked at for disease and bleed, but Kiwi gold was the only one that we were looking at for, for um, color change, and heritage was the only red that we looked at for color change. So this particular bit of information isn't exactly sweeping, okay? not representative of all the different berries in these groups. But that's not, case with, that's not the case with the decay and the bleed data. OK, red raspberries. If you're growing raspberries at all, is it red or no, Molly? You're just mostly black raspberries, right? No, we have red. You have red too. Okay. Is is red the one that most consumers are accustomed to? That's that's my thinking. So, right. So, 
I wanted to look at all the other color groups in comparison with red because that's what most consumers are used to. So the first thing that you have to know about red raspberries is they are, of all the color groups, the most tart. So I guess that's good news for all the other color groups, right? They have a ratio of soluble solids to titratable acids of 6.85. And the generally accepted ratio that you want is 10. Not in raspberries, but I mean in fruit in general. So the citrus industry will not even accept a load of juice if it's not 10. Okay, that's, that's the ratio at which people conceive of, oh, this tastes good. So raspberries are already from the get-go just a little bit on the tart side. But that's okay, a lot of people like that. <clears throat> they were intermediate in antioxidant levels, also firmness. They bled more when harvested after overcast, rainy days, and a humid night. So that was pretty complicated, but this, the, this is in your sheets, by the way, so that you can refer to this afterwards if you're concerned about this, because this really does kind of um, imply that there are certain days where if you can wait and harvest the next day, you might want to think about it. They decay faster when they're harvested after a hot, humid day. Or, I'm sorry, days, so that's three days. And you look at the yellow raspberries. They are, the, they are less acidic than the red raspberries, and um, they have, of course, you're not surprised to find out they have the lowest antioxidant levels. They are the m among the most firm, which is kind of interesting. They uh, bleed the least, but they bled more if they were harvested on an overcast day, a single day. So this is an example of a time where you may not want to harvest you can, if you can wait the next day. And they decayed the fastest, especially when harvested on a cool, overcast, humid day. So one thing you might be noticing already is that there's no correlation between the rate of decay and the rate of bleed. Now, I may be naive, but this kind of surprised me. I thought if they bled a lot, that meant there was an opportunity for pathogens to get in and you'd have more decay. Is anybody else surprised by this? Good, okay, so I'm not terribly naive. Thank you for admitting it, I appreciate it very much. <coughs> there was one very strong correlation that's very interesting. And that is between the rate of decay and the level of antioxidants, anthocyanins, phenolics. In other words, you know, those things aren't just good for people. The more antioxidants, anthocyanins, and phenolics there were, the less decay. So, I mean, uh, I'm sure if Wayne were here, he would say, as a plant pathologist, we all knew this, they used to call them phytoalexins, right? Remember? Okay, but just, just remember this, because it's interesting. So here we have the black raspberries, and they decayed the least. That's the bottom bullet point there, but that goes back to what I was just saying. They had the best ratio of soluble solids to acidity at 8.9, which is great. I happen to love black raspberries. And uh, they also had the highest antioxidant levels, lowest decay. The best part is that the decay was not affected by the weather. Not humidity, not rain, not solar radiation, nothing. So that was pretty interesting. They do bleed the most. I understand, does anybody package these? I understand there's liners specifically for black raspberries that are darker colored. I don't know, I, I asked a fellow packaging specialist at Hershey about it and he said there are. So you might want to consider that in marketing black raspberries. Purple raspberries are kind of in between black and red raspberries because, well, they're they're a cross between black and red raspberries, so that makes sense. So their antioxidants are intermediate between the black and the red, and their sweet acid ratio also is intermediate. They are the least firm, which could kind of reflect the number of genotypes we were looking at. They bled a lot, like the black raspberries, especially in cool weather, and they were pretty resistant to decay but they were sensitive to weather changes. So they, they didn't like uh, daytime humidity either. Now, this, this, um, this little aspect of Julia's research is sort of interesting. Basically, the, 
the bottom line is you can't pick raspberries early and expect them to ripen. And you guys who have experience with raspberries probably already knew that. But we got some data to support that and help explain it. Red and yellow raspberries gave off ethylene after they were harvested, which is the kind of thing that you would expect from one of those fruits that, that can be picked early and that ripen afterwards. But they also have to be respiring after they harvest or after they're harvested and, and these did not. Their respiration rate went down like it just dropped like a rock. So as I said, the short story is you can't pick these early. You have to tell your customers to pick them while they're ripe. So <laughs> I guess at this point I just want to um, say that if there are any more questions like these little birds have, we will address them with, uh, you know, looking at different genotypes. But for now, that's the breakdown of what happened with the color groups. And I don't know if you have any questions, that's the birds and you can ask. <laughs>